Hey, what's up, peeps? Back again, Drew here. Used to be that anxiety guy, now the anxious truth in the middle of the name change. Doing a new success story today with my friend Raven. Those of you who are in the Facebook group recognize Raven. We know her as Raven Lynn. That's her Facebook name. And uh, yeah, I am like super, super happy to see you on the other side of this camera. It's amazing that you are here. <laughs> And as usual, we will just kind of go through like your story and where you started and where you are now. And you've done an incredible job of this. I cannot even believe that you are the same young lady that I have seen, you know, not a year ago. It's such a difference. So thank you for taking the time. Like everybody really appreciates you sharing. And um, let's roll in it. By the way, if you're not in the Facebook group, because I know I mentioned it, there'll be a link wherever you are. Hop on in. Everybody's welcome. So we first met when you joined the group, probably we were talking maybe fall of last year, fall yeah. of 2018, somewhere in that neighborhood. Where, where were you? Tell me where you were at that point. It wasn't good. I, I know that. Yep. Not good at all. <laughs> um, so, peak of, yeah. Peak of the agoraphobia and my, like, you know, I've been dealing with panic disorder and depression and PTSD since I was like 13. I probably dealt with it even longer than that. But like, Last year was, like, super bad for my agoraphobia, like, the end of last year into this year. Um, and so, like, at that time, you know, I've been filing for SSI. I've been working with a lawyer, and I was on the highway to go see her, and that's when I just kind of started feeling, like, super panicky, had, like, my first really bad panic attack on the highway. You know, I was experiencing those feelings of, like, lightheadedness, and, like, my head felt all fuzzy, and just, like, wobbly legs felt like I was just gonna faint at any second the racing thoughts if I'm gonna die like this is it probably gonna have a heart attack probably gonna have a seizure who freaking knows what's gonna happen <laughs> and so then I took my Ativan which is my benzo and obviously that still didn't really help in the moment so then I got home after that and I finally had calmed down and I think that's kind of where I taught myself for oh if I run back home you know everything's gonna be okay again mm -hmm. So then after that, like, I was able to go up to, like, the grocery store that was, like, three blocks away, but anything further than that, or if it was, like, a bigger grocery store or anything in general, like, I just felt like I couldn't do it, and so, like, um, after that, I ended up, I think it was, like, around New Year's Eve, I had to go run a few errands, and I was super excited, I was like, yay, I get to get out of the house, it had been snowing a lot, so I wasn't leaving very much, mm -hmm. um, Plus, I was having car issues at that time. So being able to leave was like, oh, thank God I was going to go get my favorite lunch. And that was all ruined by a super bad panic attack. That was like to the point where like I was I was convinced I was going to die in that car ride. I'm pretty sure I posted in the group after that had happened, too. And at the same time, I took my Benzo and it's still just like really didn't do anything. Even getting home didn't really do much either. And then mm -hmm. finally I calmed down, but I still had that like hangover I guess you could say. Of now, that, was, that was right after New Year's that happened, right? Yeah. Because yep. I remember so, around Christmas, you managed to kind of get out. And I remember yeah. you saying like you were with your family at Christmas. And it seemed yeah. like a little bit of a step forward. And then yeah. that happened. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So it was like really weird. Because like, I remember, um, I think it was Christmas Eve to be exact. Like a few days before that, I went and I baked cookies with my family. And it was like a lot of fun. But then New Year's Eve or Christmas Eve, like... The worst thing that I remember was I grabbed my phone while I was getting ready because I was like, I don't want to miss out on this. I'm tired of missing family events because of this. Mm -hmm. And I ended up calling the epilepsy hotline. <laughs> I was like, are you sure I'm not going to have a seizure? Can I Let's... go to this family event and not have a seizure? Yeah. And they're yeah. just like, are you kidding me? Why are you calling us? And so the lady just laughed the whole time and I felt so embarrassed, but that was like my, my little crutch. Like I had to call the epilepsy hotline in order to go do what I wanted. And then that didn't really help either. So. Let's, let's talk about that for a second, because I do sure. remember the thing that sticks out the most, I think about your story and the way you were back then is you, you were still determined. I mean, you were not just accepting like, Oh, my life is over, mm -hmm. but you were gripped and crippled by that seizure fear. I know the seizure fear. <laughs> And I mean, yeah. how many times did you ask in the group, you know, if you're, am I going to have a seizure? I'm going to, I feel like I'm going to have a seizure. You must have typed the word seizure more than most epileptics do in a lifetime. I know, right? Right. Uh, but like that felt so, that was a real fear though. In yeah. your mind, you were convinced. Exactly. Like straight up so convinced that I was like, I've never had a seizure in a day in my life, but I have epilepsy. That's basically how it was. Even it was though. Weird. But let's clarify, you don't have epilepsy in your nope, head. Not at all. 
you yep. who are convinced though, like I obviously have epilepsy here. Yep, exactly. And it, it's almost a textbook example of the the incredible irrationality. And and as I said before we went and started recording, I mean you're an incredibly intelligent young woman. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. Yet that did not matter. Like exactly that not incredible <laughs> like distortion just took hold, and that was real yep. for you. Yeah. So, so you had that massive setback right after the new year. And I I remember you kind of, kind of crawling in and just like in pieces, this is terrible. Like it's never going to get better. What happened after that? Um, so like after all that happened, I guess, um, earlier this year, like, I think what really clicked for me was like, I wasn't leaving my house, but I kept wanting to. And I was just so fed up with the fact that, like, I would only be able to walk down my drive, like, my driveway, then the alleyway. And that was it. I was like, I really want to go outside. Like, being inside all the time is so boring. It's tiring. I need to go drop this off. I need to go do that. I need to go to this appointment. I couldn't get anything done because I was so, like, bedridden. Like, and, you know, it got to the point where I actually thought I had, like, fibromyalgia because Mm -hmm. I was in so much pain from being bedridden for weeks. And so, like, I think what was bothering me really bad, too, was, like, when I was with my fiancé, his, like, family and his friends were, like, super against how I was and were were just kind of, like, tearing me down and were, like, she's not going to get any better. Like, you're just wasting your time with her. And it was just everybody kind of attacking me where it was just, like, "Mm, this isn't helping me. And then after that, that kind of motivated me a little bit to, like, prove people wrong Mm -hmm. and prove myself wrong because I started to just kind of feel like this is it like this is all that's left for me and just kind of that thought like sent a lot of anxiety just like throughout my entire body because I didn't want to just live the rest of my life just in my bed like that wasn't who I was a few years ago like a few years ago I was like I was determined on my 18th birthday I was going to travel to the west coast on my own (laughs) like I had everything like just dead straight and then I lost all of it to agoraphobia so then like um you know when I when I started having issues with my fiance and then I was seeing like a therapist but we were doing teletherapy Mm -hmm. so like that was really beneficial because I wasn't skipping any appointments like she helped me tremendously and just like I think a big key in like where things started to click for me was having a therapist that actually listened to me and like was super like determined to help me get back together and wasn't like basically telling me like this is it or you need medication it was like you're in there we're gonna get you out of there like hold on and then taking an approach with my PTSD like apparently with PTSD if it's not like worked on it can Mm -hmm. also cause more problems like panic disorder depression whatever sure and so they started to think that that was what happened to me because when I um when my trauma did happen I didn't do anything about it I just Mm kind of like they just were like here's medication you're fine like you'll get over it just take these and so I was a 13 year old and that had happened and it just didn't do anything for me it just kind of kept getting worse but um anyways back to where I was um so I was seeing that therapist and then a few months into the year, she started mentioning joining like an intensive outpatient program. Um, because that's when my like intrusive thoughts started getting really bad. And, um, it was like scaring me. And I just, I was like, nothing's right. I don't, I don't know what's going on with me. I was, I was like, I'm losing it. This is it. Um, so she recommended that, but I ended up not doing it at first. I was just kind of like, I'm too scared. Like I had too many stomach problems. Yeah. Right. Too scared to actually go. Yeah, exactly. I had excuses after excuses. It was my stomach pain, too much anxiety attacks. I was going to end up discharging myself. Like I just was like, no, I'm not going like, but, but you weren't, you didn't want to not do the program. You were like, just like literally afraid to go out of the house and go to the the, the center. Right. Yep. So it it was like, I, if I left the house, like I just wouldn't be worth it. Cause last time I did a program with that clinic, they discharged me after two weeks because my agoraphobia was bad then too. And I was just like, calling I was like I'm gonna have a seizure today I can't come in sorry (laughs) like I just had it all planned out that I was gonna have a seizure right um and so then it got brought up again by her and she was just like you should really really try this you kind of need the extra help right now having therapy for an hour two times a week wasn't gonna be enough Mm. and so I was like okay 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 I was like I need to get this together and especially because I was having so many issues in my relationship with my fiance as well like it just felt like everything was falling apart and it was my fault, especially because he put the blame on me a lot of the time too. So it was like, 
I was like, this is all me. Like, I, if I don't fix this, nothing else is going to get fixed. So that was when I decided to go in. And the night before my intake or, like, the assessment or whatever, my cat of, like, 21 years ended up dying. So I go into this assessment. I was like, I called my therapist that day. I was like, I don't think I'm even going to be able to go into this assessment. I was like, my cat died. I feel like crap. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I go, pulled myself together. I went and I was a sobbing mess. I looked like crap and I still went anyways. And they're like, why are you even here? Like, go home, come back another day, reschedule it. I was like, no, I need to get this done. And so I sobbed in the office with the psychologist and I was just like, I just, I don't know what's wrong with me anymore. Like, and now I'm experiencing intrusive thoughts. I'm crazy. Like, I just, I was like, I'm going to end up with psychosis or something. Like, it was just a whole bunch of different things. And, yeah. like, um, after that, I started the outpatient program, which was, like, four days a week for, like, from, like, 1.30 to 4.30. Mm-hmm. And so I was just taking it one day at a time. I was like, okay, if you really feel like it's going to be that bad and you need to discharge yourself, whatever. Just take it one day at a time. That was, like, what I was living by. And so there were days where I couldn't show up. I had a hard time and I started beating myself up over it. And that's what determined me to go and stay through the anxiety. And like, you know, they had these little rooms where you could step aside and just kind of like take care of yourself if you needed to. But the entire team was like super supportive. And so like anytime I had panic attack problems or like just wasn't feeling good and I had to step out, somebody would sit with me and just like, like my social worker, I think it was, she sat with me for like three hours. And then when she decided I, she wanted to take me to the emergency room. I was like, no, no, don't do that. Like, this is going to screw everything up. Like, don't take me to the damn emergency room. That's amazing. Uh, (laughs) Right. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of which I have not gone to the emergency room for anxiety since that day. So that was like the end of June, which was like, I'm I'm killing it there. Um, But yeah, so like she sat with me in the emergency room and after she left, like she was like telling them, don't let her leave, like stay with her, make sure she gets treated. When they were done, I was like, can I just go home? Like, I don't want to be here. This is the last place I want to be. I want to be home. Yeah. And so they discharged me. I didn't take the benzo. I didn't take anything. I just went home and I was still anxious when I went home too, but that was where I really sat with it and like just nailed it. I was like, holy crap, I did that. Um, that was a so, huge turning point. I, yeah, re- like, I remember you talking yeah. about that. Exactly. Yeah. I had about two really big panic attacks while I was there that had me in like the little serenity room, they called it. Yep. And I remember just sitting there for hours and hours and I would just be panicking so bad. And then I'd go home and everything would feel a little bit better. And I'd be like, whoa. So like I'm teaching myself in that moment that you can still get through the panic while you're driving in a car. Does, in the doesn't hospital. matter. Doesn't matter where you are. It really doesn't at all. Like you can get through it as long as you like, I feel like as long as you have the mindset, like if you're sitting there telling yourself, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Then you're going to feel like you're going to die. Yep. Yep. So that's where I really like mastered the floating was sitting with it in a time where they were like forcing me to stay. And I was like, no, no, I need to go home. Like I remember pulling like my instructor aside. I was like, I need to go home. Like, I can't do this. I, I just, I can't. She's and like, did they, so she kind of talked to you into like, just, just give it five more minutes, just five more yeah. minutes kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, right? yeah. She's like, we'll see if it gets really bad. And if it gets really bad, you can go home. And I was like, okay, well, it kept getting bad. And they're just like, do you want to stay or do you want to go to the ER? And I'm like, well, I'd rather stay than go to the ER. So mm-hmm. I kind of was just like, I didn't really have the option to go home. Cause obviously if I had the option to go home, I would have taken it. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I feel like if there's anything really big that I learned and was taught that was effective being there, wasn't what was in the books. It wasn't coloring in a coloring book. It wasn't reading positive affirmations that I'm beautiful and I'm strong, but it was literally sitting in a serenity room that was just an option if things got too emotional, if you needed to go cry. Yeah. I sat in that serenity room and was forced to face the panic attack for like three hours. That was where I really started to learn. So I want to talk about that for just a second, because mm-hmm. yes, that, that obviously a huge turning point. And yeah. really, because I, I know people are going to ask this when they watch you say this, yeah. that would really be flooding. So what happened is you were essentially trapped in a circumstance yeah. <laughs> where you had no choice but to be out of your safe zone, the house, and in panic, in a panic state yep. for 
three hours. That was the duration yeah. of the program. So you're there at least three hours. That That is not something that you would want to uh, – well, I'm trying to put this the right way so that people get the right message. <laughs> right. You wouldn't want to do that to yourself. But you you kind of or seem to be – and correct me if I'm wrong, but you kind of t- seem to be at a place in your life where – you were willing to do that yeah. really hard thing because you wanted to get better. Exactly. You wanted to change your life. So you were willing to accept it. And the fact that you did this through was essentially flooding. Yeah. And you had the staff with you. And it sounds like they did it really well with you, which yeah. is great. Um, that probably made all the difference in the world. So it's so super important to say, like, you can't. I know you're going to hear Raven say, like, I just I was locked in a room and had to yeah. panic for three hours. <laughs> that seems so tempting. Like, oh, that's the cure. I'm going to go do that this weekend. <laughs> Like, don't do that. You had you had professionals with you. Yeah. <laughs> and you had taken a long road to get to the point where you were willing to accept that. You know? Exactly. Yeah. You could have insisted, no, you get me out of here right now. We're taking yeah. you to the hospital. You participated and said, no, I'm staying here. Exactly. Yeah. So I did, like, uh, we needed to yeah. say that. Yeah. Yeah. But you feel like that was a big, big turning point, though. Yeah. It was where I really felt like I mastered like acceptance and floating. Like, cause you know, when I heard floating, I was like, I can't do it, Drew. Like, I can't do it. This is impossible. You're we wrong. We had the conversation so many times. So many. <laughs> this can't be. I this can't be a thing. It. Yeah. Exactly. Like I was just like, you know, other people can do it, but I can't like, it's right. like, I can't do it. It's not, it's not for me. Like this isn't effective for me. This is, this isn't it. Right. And then I did it but, and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> well, that's a really good point. And, I, and we can talk about that for 30 seconds here. Like you always thought you couldn't do it. I mean, yes. you were very down on yourself. You, you figured there's no way this won't work for me. I have something yes. different going. You, no one is ever ready to do it until exactly. they do it. So do yes. you feel like, oh, oh, I, oh, I guess I was ready. Cause I, look, I did it. Like only doing it tells you that you can do it. There's, exactly. You, will never be ready in your head to say, okay, I'm, I'm ready to surrender to death because in your head, that's what you do. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. You'll never get there until you actually do it, wind up. Okay. And say, Oh yeah. Okay. Now I can, now I know what it is. Now I can do it. Exactly. Do you feel like that is what happened for you? Absolutely. Cause it was like, I spent so many days where I would walk around the block and go to the grocery store and keep pushing, but it was like, it still wasn't enough to get like for me to master it. Like I do it. And I just still didn't feel that like that sense of accomplishment Mm -hmm. until that day I was sitting in that room and I was forced with it. It was like sitting in the room with it, sitting across from me screaming, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. And I had to sit there and be like, no, I'm not like, it was like having a conversation with it in that room. And after that, I was like, Whoa, I was like, so that's what floating is. I was like, no way. Like it was, it was insane. So after that, that's when I started, like, I, I haven't really had big anxiety attacks since. And even if I have, like, I didn't call 911. I didn't sit there and like freak out, like, and say that I'm going to die. Like I just kind of sat with it. I was like, okay. Yeah. Sometimes I cry a little bit, but whatever. <laughs> you're, you're, it's just astounding when you see it. And I've seen so many, but yet it's always still astounding. You are especially astounding to see the smile on your face and just so relaxed, like, yeah, whatever, you know, yeah, I'm just going to have a massive panic attack, whatever. Like you were so, you were so the opposite of that only 10, 12 months ago, max. If that, like, if that, if that really, I think it didn't really turn for me until the end of June is when it started to like, I really noticed it. Yeah. And then after I, I broke off my engagement, like after that, like, boom, everything was so good. Like, getting out of the house, spending almost 10 hours a day on the road doing DoorDash with my best friend. Like, yep. I was yep. like, if I could do this, I could do anything. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and suddenly now you're being productive. I remember you yeah. like coming into the group and wondering, like, give me things to do. I'm bored. You were starting to get to the point where like, I'm bored. I need things yeah. to do. Exactly. So the cool thing that I think about your story when I watched it develop over time was you started changing the way you were doing it. You went to the inpatient Mm -hmm. program, you learned the lessons about panic there. And then you seem to get to the point where you understood I, I, I'm going to keep recovering, but I actually want to live also. Yeah. Like I don't want to just sit in my room and color in a coloring book every single day, listening to like, podcasts about right, people right. who are traveling the world and I'm sitting here in my room yeah I want to do that someday as I color in a coloring book like it just wasn't effective 
for me, I have a super overactive like mind. Like I just, I have too much energy to be sitting in my room all day yeah. expecting recovery to happen while I'm laying in bed. It's not going to happen. Even way. when you in, are engaged in recovery, I mean, I would think, and, and tell me, I, I'm going to, I'm going to assume that you can tell me if I'm wrong. You get started getting out of the house. You're doing DoorDash with your girlfriend. So I remember yeah. posting the pictures and you had this big smile on your face. You guys like you're having a good time. Oh, yeah. You know, you're working together, which was great. And so that helps your recovery, but it's not necessarily a recovery task. You're just living. Yeah. You're just exactly. doing life. Just doing and, what and other life people becomes do. becomes recovery, right? So yeah. at some point. Exactly. Now you were probably on an accelerated time frame because you you did a bunch of flooding and you jammed that acceptance oh, and yeah. like facing down the fear into a tiny yeah. little ball. But uh so, so you lose, a, a, you know, it was maybe a less than optimal relationship in your life. And the stress of that, I guess, goes away. Mm-hmm. And you've got this new outlook on what anxiety and panic is. You're not afraid of it anymore. So you didn't make it go away. You just stopped being afraid of it, it sounds like. Exactly. Like, yeah. you know, I, I had an issue a few weeks ago while door dashing on the highway where I started to get really panicky during rush hour, like dead stop traffic. And we're dropping off this order, which happened to end up being at a hospital, <laughs> um, which was oh, ironic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so sitting there, I'm like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. But you know, I had my best friend with me and I just kept telling myself, like, I'm safe. Like I wasn't sitting there, like enabling the thoughts that I was going to die. It was more like changing the thoughts. Like, you know, you feel like you're going to die, but you're not like, the, mm-hmm. you know, you're safe. You're fine. Yeah. You're okay. Yeah. And yeah. so then we get to the hospital and I sat in the, in the, in the parking lot before we go in and I'm like, you know what, I might just need to sit in this parking lot for a while. Like, I just, I just need to sit here. Like I, I might, I might need their services today. I don't know. This panic attack's feeling pretty bad. So then she's like, well, do you want to wait in the car while I go in? And I'm like, no, like, I just, I want to keep doing this. Like, I mm-hmm. want to keep going. I don't want to stop because of this panic attack. So we go in and then we walk out and she's like, okay, well, do you want to sit for a little bit? I'm like, no, let's just go home. All good. <laughs> it's fine. Like I was panicking, but I was like, it's fine. And then I was like, let's just keep going. She's like, well, let's just relax for a little bit. I'm like, but I want to keep going. I, you know, I still feel panicky and my body feels like crap, but let's keep going. But she's like, well, let's just relax for a little bit. So I went home and I think this is the last time I've actually taken my Benzo. I felt Mm -hmm. really off. So I was just like, I just kind of need to relax for a second. Mm -hmm. Took it, took a nap, woke up, went right back to door dashing again. It just didn't faze me that much. Yeah. There's no retreat in you anymore. It's, I can exactly. I can see. Yeah. So like, nice. and I, I say this all the time, it's never how you feel. It's always how you react to how you feel. And your reaction exactly. to how you feel is completely different now. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. The reaction is like a really big deal. Like if you give it a negative reaction, then it's just going to keep building over time and it's just going to get worse and worse. But the more that you start giving like more of a positive reaction or just not a reaction a at neutral all. neutral reaction, right. Exactly. Like yeah. just kind of take a normal approach to it. I feel like I know that sounds hard because like when, when you're going through this, it, it's completely difficult, yep. but it just felt like to me, if I just kind of gave it that normal reaction and just, yeah, it just felt like it was now where I am. It feels like it's a lot easier to do it. It does get easier over time. Yeah. And I think, you know, what's great is that you did compress it in your special <laughs> circumstance, but it also means that you haven't had a year and a half of practice. So exactly. that will get better and better over time. And obviously it seems to already yeah. be getting better. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. So at this point, what's going to come next? Like, I don't want to go too much longer. We try and keep it about a half hour. Um, but so now you, you've made these giant strides, like what's on the horizon? What do you, what's going to happen next? I really I'm hoping, okay, so my parents are burlesque dancers, and my mom just started no. traveling out of state for it, which is That really is incredibly cool. interesting. I know. <laughs> <Who> <laughs> um, <knew? just> <laughs> right? <laughs> so November, they have a show in, I think it's Kent, Ohio, um, so it's like a 15-hour drive, and I really want to go with. I'm, like, super tempted. I'm like, I'm going to do it. Um, only thing is I have to come up with the money to, like, have a hotel room. So it. it's a little iffy, but I'm like, I want to do it. Like, even if I'm not like actually going to like do the trip, like if something came up financially where I couldn't go, right. even just planning to do these things, like mm-hmm. it, it just feels so good. I get so excited. I'm like, I can actually do this. I can even sit here and plan it without feeling those negative emotions. Of, like right. I can't do it. So, so it's um, not about like, well, I might not be able to do it. It could be practical yeah. things that will keep you from doing it, monitor exactly. your schedule or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. 
Exactly. And I can even practice over time. I could go on a little two hour like car ride up north or something, do yeah. something fun yep. like that. Like I could build the exposure therapy up if I really needed to, but it's just like it it feels so good to be able to say like, I want to do this rather than I want to do this, but I don't think I can do it. I don't think I'm going to ever be able to ever again. Now I'm at the place where I'm like, I want to go here, then next there and just keep planning it over and over. And like, I know we have like a, like a, every year we go to Vegas, like it's like a one once a year trip thing. Mm -hmm. And I think next year we're going in June and I'm like, I want to make it this time. I want to go. (laughs) Do you have any doubt that you're going to be there? I mean, Mm. Okay. I, just honest. I, I, <laughs> I I'm I want to go, but I'm I'm still a little I, like just a little nervous because that one's more of like a I think we're on the road for like 24 hours, but we mm. stop in like a state, sleep overnight, and then go. Yeah. So I'm like that one might be a little tricky, but if I could do the Ohio one, I could definitely do that one. So yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm not thinking I'm trying to not think too ahead of myself because like I don't I don't want to screw it up. <laughs> But at the same time, I'm like, I want to do it. I'm like, yeah, you want. And I'll I'll tell you what's going to wind up happening. Like, if you don't even have to do the 15 hours, if you did a three or four hour overnight thing, you're done. You'll be fine. You'll be in Vegas. Yeah. I could sit on the road door dashing for 10 hours. There's no difference. Same city. Yeah. There's no difference. Yeah. And so that's a a super important point. Like, that 10 hours out on the road, it didn't matter how far away you went. Exactly it makes you want to jump in the car and go 15 hours to Ohio. So there you go. It really does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so great. It's and then so next great. year I'm going to be in another country. Like I'm just sitting here like, I, yeah. that's what I want to do. Like, yeah. even if it doesn't happen, like just because of like finances or something, I'm just sitting yeah. here like, I want to do that. Yeah. So. And you will. And like you, you actually can see that you can and you have confidence and you're smiling exactly. and, and like there's a future in front of you. So exactly. I, I couldn't be more happy for you. This is so awesome. Yeah, me too. Like, yeah. it, it's a big deal just like thinking of where I was like even just a few months ago to where I am now. But it also took a lot of weeding out a lot of negative things like and realizing that it's just not all my fault. Like, you know, there were so many big drastic changes that I had to make for my life. And, you know, it, I did it for me. I didn't do it for anybody else. I did it just for me. Like I had to stay super dedicated and committed to it rather than just be like, okay, I'm going to do it. Like if yeah. you just have that mindset, you're going to go into it and it's not going to, you're not going to see a recovery like this. If you go and you're like, this is going to suck, but I need to do it. Like you have to want it for yourself. And once you go and you do it and you start like, and it's, it's not like an easy thing. It's not coloring a coloring book every day. And it's not smiles and giggles every day as you're sitting in this room talking about your traumas and like your experiences yeah. with panic and agoraphobia and health anxiety and depression, whatever. Like it's, sitting there through the tears and blood and sweat and just like not wanting to be there, but still showing up anyways, doing the work, going home, taking a four hour nap because you're so drained, waking up and doing it, doing it again for six weeks. And that was just for the program in general. I've been at this since I was 13 years old. And then I stepped foot in a psychiatrist's office and they're like, you're stable. I'm like, I'm sorry. What, what, what is right, that? Right, right. <laughs> Wait, like, what? what huh? <laughs> now, let me ask you a silly so, question. I, I have to ask the question. Were they were they surprised to see that? Because I remember you struggling yeah. with. They want They're insisting on putting me on meds to stabilize yeah. me. I need these meds. They insist I need them. Like, w- was it a surprise to them to see? Like, holy crap, you're like okay now. Yeah, like it. It was really amazing for them and for me. Like, a, a lot of people were kind of doubtful that I was even going to sit through the program. Like, mm-hmm. and just and see the day I get discharged like when I ended up getting discharged you know they do this thing where they go around the circle and everybody says how like you impacted their life and what they've seen in you and they're just like it's so amazing to see where you were when you got here to where you are now like the instructor almost wanted to like cry because she was like holy crap like this is happening and so like everybody kind of acknowledging that makes me feel super excited because it's like even I know where I was and how long I've been struggling with this since I was 13 is the longest I can think of. Mm. Um, I've gone through this and I haven't really seen a stable day. Like anytime I wanted to be considered stable, doctors were like, you're not going to get stable unless you take an SSRI. And I'm just like, well, I don't want to take that because it makes me feel worse. So, mm-hmm. um, there you go. so I remember a few months ago, it was like earlier this year, I was messaging my primary care doctor And I was like, I'm going to have a seizure. This is it. You know, these medications aren't helping me. I don't know what to do. (laughs) So he was like, 
Um, he told me something about how I wasn't going to fix my brain chemistry or train my brain unless I take a medication, like an antidepressant. Really? And I was just kind of like, I was like, you know what? Exactly. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> That's like... what that gets. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> two hundred thousand dollars in four years of medical school you get this exactly (laughs) so i turn around and i'm like sure okay and now here i am and i just kind of i almost want to set up an appointment to go in to see him and just kind of yeah give him the middle finger (laughs) like look at me now yeah Um, (laughs) how you like me now (laughs) i get it Uh, you know and and i'm being facetious and and funny to a certain extent but i think (laughs) what you did is astounding and what you have ahead of you is astounding. I just want to mention one more thing. So, so we don't go too long. You did mention the PTSD thing. And, and I understand that it, when you were in that outpatient, you know, inpatient, I guess would be when you're in the inpatient program every day for six weeks, I know it was focused on that. It was kind of a PTSD, a trauma resolution program, right? So you say, well, you didn't really get anything out of the affirmations and stuff. It was the process of, of being forced to confront yeah. the fear. So oh, yeah. The biggest leap forward was that mechanical nuts and bolts thing of face the fear, learn not to be afraid. Exactly. But the trauma is important. I I, I always try and acknowledge that. What happened to you is real, and you did learn that you had to deal with it in some way. So I assume that there was at least some of that that you have worked through in a a productive way and maybe still will continue for some time, right? That's part of this. It wasn't just sitting in a panic. Like you also had to do some other work. (laughs) There was definitely a lot of things. And you don't have to be detailed about it. It's okay. But we always just try and acknowledge that it's not just about floating through panic in every case. (laughs) It's a a lot of work. Like, you know, you see in the group, like, you know, float through it, accept it, whatever. It's not as simple as just hearing it and then going and doing it. Like it takes a lot of work, a lot of practice to do it. Cause like, You know, that when I would hear you say that in the group, I would just think like, well, I can't do this tomorrow. Like, I can't be cured tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. No, it don't work that way. Exactly. And I think a lot of people, they hear that, they see what you have to say, because I think you have like a tough love approach. So then when people hear what you have to say, they, because I know for me personally, I got like intimidated. I was like, I have to do this tomorrow. If I don't do it tomorrow, Drew's going to be pissed at me. That was like my my wake up. Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, no. not true. I feel like (laughs) maybe people, they see that and then they see how other people are doing and they think like, well, I can't do that because they, they just see what's going on in the group. They don't see it in an outside perspective, what we're right. all doing. What, what you're actually doing. doing. Yeah, yeah, like we can all post a video of us driving in our car, but it's so much more than that. Like It is. So that's where I feel like people really in the group really need to acknowledge that it's not, it's definitely not something that that's going to happen overnight. This is something you got to stay dedicated to for weeks. So yeah, yeah. That's, that's my least. little message. Yeah. Well, th- well, thank you so much, and I appreciate it. Yeah. All right. This has been so great. I'm so happy that you took the time. I like. I cannot thank you enough for that. Um, yeah. All I ever ask is pay it forward, and you just did. So yeah, exactly. Thank, I'm, thank you so I'm much. Excited about this. I appreciate yeah. you. Like, yeah, that's really great. Okay, we're good. Thank you so much. I'm sure we'll you know we'll talk again soon. Exactly. For so sure. for those of, those of you watching, I'll put it on. I'm gonna. This will be on YouTube. It'll be on Facebook. On wherever I am, you know. So it's thatanxietyguy.com or theanxioustruth.com. We'll both get you to the same place. I'm gonna have to make that work now when we get done. <laughs> so before I put up the video, and uh, yeah, we're good to go. So thank you very much. And yeah. if, by the way, if people have questions, would maybe the Facebook group, if they want to ask you yeah. questions, would that be the Absolutely. best place? That's so follow the link, join the group, and if and you can comment on the video there, and Raven will be hanging around, tag yes, or whatever. Always. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, yeah, guys. No yep. All yep. Right. See you on the next one. I will see stop the recording.